hello good day and welcome back so today we're gonna be getting into how we are gonna tie our front end to our back end and specifically we're going to implement more capabilities in our simple API server to support our front end okay so what are we gonna do in this section we're going to implement in our backend API server how to create user get all the user, update a user, and delete a user. And we're gonna use the slash API slash V1 slash user endpoint. Um, so I'll explain a little bit what I mean about endpoint and why V1. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about security. Only so far as I said that we're really not gonna provide any security. And the reason why is because security is really, really complex and we really wouldn't be able to do a good job in our application to be any kind of production ready application. So we're just gonna accept that oh, we're not gonna have security and kind of move on. But we're gonna talk about some of the places and the type of things you'd wanna do if you wanted to secure application. Later on, we're gonna see how we're gonna get security, and pretty good security, by using tools that are already available and developed by people who are much more clever and who have spent their time studying this thing. So. That's about it, so let's kind of jump in. Uh, we have to work our way through a lot. This is gonna be a long video. On the previous slide, I said that our, our endpoint is gonna be called slash API slash V1 slash user. So why version our API? Well, there are a number of reasons, but some of the benefits include that it's obvious to users of your API which version they're using. They don't have to go to your documentation. The second thing is, it's easy for you to depreciate um, features. So for example, if you want to come up with some new capabilities and you don't want to support a previous version, you just simply create version two or three or whatever, and then inform your user that they should be using that one. And then you can choose for how long you want to support the older version. And so being able to version your API and be able to make it painless for users to know what they're using and what is supported is going to become a benefit for you and your users as you start developing you know enterprise level application or application that people depend on so here's an example let's say going down the left here are my um, API versions so I'm going to cross the page um, the top are my client version so of course if I have correspondent client and server that's supported so version 1 of client matches version 1 of server of the API works fine but if you take a look at when I have an API server version two running, I can support clients who, um, that are both version one client and version two client. But when you go to API version three, I may not want to support version one client. So by having my server only respond to API slash V2 and slash V3, I am saying that I only support clients that are version three, that know to speak version three and client know to speak version two and I can block or not support those version one client for whatever reason. As I said before, we're not gonna be dealing with security in this implementation of our application. When you're ready for security, we're gonna use libraries. But some of the things you might wanna think about when, you, um, when I'm talking about security is how to prevent um, denial of service attack. Denial of service attack are pretty popular. They're not as popular now as they used to be about 10, 15 years ago, but basically it's when um, bad actors send so many requests to a server that they prevent the server from doing real work or other users who have you know, legitimate use of that service from getting through. So you can imagine that somebody somewhere flooded, uh, sent a ton of requests to Google and because Google servers are busy trying to respond to those bad requests, you couldn't get you to do your Google search or check your email and so on. And those things used to be um, very popular a few years ago, well, a couple of dec a decade or so ago. Um, another thing is that if you have security in your application, these bad actors or auto bad actors can corrupt your data. Um, they might either um, try to delete things that um, you know they don't have access to, or um, try to create invalid data in your database. Um, and sometimes that you don't necessarily want security because uh, you have anything to hide necessarily. It's just that not because um, the information is not, let's say, dangerous or anything, or anybody's gonna die as a result of seeing it, doesn't mean that 
um, you want everyone um, to have access to it. So for example, you might have a medical record online, but you won't necessarily want that to be public. You don't mind if your family or friends see it, but you don't want everybody else to be able to see it for whatever reason. So there are things that we want to keep private, and it doesn't necessarily mean that oh, we have secrets to hide or ain't doing anything illegal. It's just that certain things just probably needs to be kept private. And so um, for some of those are some of the reasons why you'd want security in your application. Not all the reasons, but those are some of the reasons. So okay, so now let's talk about set, how we set up our project. So I'm in this directory, and I'm showing you a list of the files. And so you can barely see some of it there, but basically, sorry for the color, but basically I have two directory, a client directory and a server directory. Inside of my server directory, I have my app.js, which is for my node, um, you know, backend that's going to use node to create a, the API service. And then in the client directory, I essentially copy the files, the to-do files, application files for Angular from the last section of chapter six. So on this slide, you can see where I get my files and where I put them. So now that we have our project directory set up, let's talk about the code that we're going to be writing. So you said we're going to be implementing the endpoint slash API slash version one slash user. And the methods we're going to implement is pose, get, update, which is put, and delete. And we already said we're not going to really handle security. Um, our client already, the front end already, um, does some little bit of security in terms of asking you to log in and only if you're an admin user um, try to create a user and so on but that's as far as our security is going to go um, if you're not using our client as you're going to see you're going to be able to actually create users and all that stuff without the front end so any security that the front end doesn't provide the back end doesn't really enforce or add anything else really one thing we need to talk about that we haven't talked about before is the handling of headers required for the option method that is basically when we see an op a request and the method is specified as options, what is the response supposed to be and what headers do we need to send back? And this has to do with something called cross-site scripting and cross-origin re resource sharing. So let's talk about that first. Par, we have really been thinking of a web server, like when you connect to your Gmail application, you tend to have an idea that you connect to the Gmail web server and it serve up your you know, Gmail application in your browser. And so you can kind of think of it this way. There's a web server and there are some ports open, those um, um, hectagons there. And so those are the ports and clients connect to a port, like, you know, port 80 or port 8080 or 443, whatever. And they can access an application. And then what the web server sends back um, is to the client are all the pages and JavaScript and everything else, the files representing what should be rendered in their web browser. And then, of course, with the JavaScript that's downloaded for the front end, the, the JavaScript can now talk to the back end and give you all your fancy capabilities that you expect in your modern web application. So that's how we sort of think of it. And it's okay to think of it that way. And for a while, it kind of worked that way. But that's not exactly how things always are, and that's not always going to be for us. So in this setup, what you can imagine is that once your browser downloads the client code, which is the JavaScript and then the HTML pages and everything that needs to render that page, and then you take an action, like you want to send something to the backend, like post, you can imagine that your JavaScript code in Angular, for example, is going to ask the browser to do that post. That request is going to, browser is then going to send that request to the server. The server responds. And then your browser now invoke your JavaScript code, which is, you know, in Angular, which would say, hey, that request was successful. Another deployment scenario would have us use multiple web servers, for example. And one web server would serve up just the front end um, resources, which is, you know, the JavaScript, the HTML, the images, whatever we need for the front end. And then once the client download that, they can now have, they have the JavaScript and the JavaScript now would make requests, you know, the API calls to a server and yet another server uh, which is running the backend. So now you've separated the client um, resources on one server and the backend resources on another server. Now, you can still run them separately on the same server, but we're going to say it's already on separate servers.
But when you do this, when you separate your client front end and your back end services like this, for your browser anyway, not for anything else, for your browser like Chrome or Firefox, it knows and it knows that hey, you downloaded JavaScript and from one server and know that that JavaScript that you downloaded is trying to connect to yet another server. So what it's going to do is it says, hey, you're actually doing a cross-site scripting request or cross-origin resource sharing. And so for this, it tries to ask that API server, hey, this guy is trying to make a post. Is this supported? So what the browser, even though in your code you only do a post just as before, the browser sends a option request, a request to this backend server with the option method and some headers that says this is what you would like to do, which is you'd like to make a post request and so on. And then the server now could reply back and say, oh yes, I support or I love posts from this origin or from this client and so on. And then once the server responds saying that oh, it's allowed, then the browser would look at that, those headers that are in the reply, the response, and if it's contains one of those that the, you, the code is trying to initiate, initiate like post, then it would actually send the post request. Why does the browser even support something like this? And again, this is only the browser that does this. You, from your command line, when you use curl, it doesn't do it because curl is not loading any code, JavaScript code that it then trying to execute and connect the browser. And so if you had a, um, somebody who's malicious and somehow loaded your client code or tried to manipulate it in some way, and try to make a request to your server, if the browser notice that's what they're doing and send this option header, you can make a decision as to whether or not that operation they're trying to perform is supported or is supported from that client and a whole bunch of other things. But even with option header, it still doesn't prevent somebody from trying to spoof or come and attack your website pretending to be somebody else. So that's why the security thing is so deep and broad that we are not going to really touch it and just depend on libraries to solve our problem because these things are just very difficult. But this part we need to handle, the option request. Talk first about how we run the code um, before we actually talk about the code itself. So here I have three um, terminals open. In the top, I'm going to run the client code by running Python in my client directory. And it doesn't matter which port number you use. The only important thing is that in your client code, it knows where the server is running and it used the correct port number in this, the code. And so in the middle one, I'm running the server or the API backend, and this is our node application. And so this is gonna run on port 3000, and I have to make sure again that my client connects to port 3000. And the bottom one is where I'm gonna actually use to create my first user account because I don't have any, my application doesn't start with one, but I'm gonna do a post using curl to the server backend and have that account created. And that's why I said there's no security that anyone can actually create and delete accounts and see all the accounts. It's only our front end that prevents, you know, somebody who logged in doesn't have admin privileges for not, to not do those things. But if someone bypass that and don't use our front end, they can certainly do all those things. Look at the front end changes that we made between the user service that we had in our to do application in chapter six, at the end of chapter six, and we have to do no to make it work with our backend, you see it's not a whole lot. Um, basically, we just have to say that, oh, we're gonna be pointing that we're use, where we expect to log in, and where we expect to do user um, you know, request, request for a request, which is post, get, and so on. And then our get all user function, we just changed that so now it queries the backend when it wants to get the users. Um, in terms of removing a user, again, we just do a post, a delete, sorry, to delete users to the backend. Um, same thing with updating users, we use the put method, and you can look at the code there. You should be seeing the pattern by now. Um, this is add user, it's a post, and look very much like the previous methods, and the other ones to come. Um, for login, it's again very straightforward. There's a post to login. If you go on GitHub and you browse the code, you're going to see it looks very straightforward. It's not anything we haven't done before. On the back end, again, I'm going to go through really quickly some of the methods, but um, again, it's a little fuzzy here. 
but you're going to see nothing new, nothing that you haven't seen before. It's very fairly straightforward. I don't try to pull the wool over your eyes, but you can download the code, check it out, and go into the separate directories, you know, open up the three terminals, and then run the code. And if you have questions or issues, definitely post comments and let me know. I should probably provide an email, so that's another way of reaching me. Uh, that's a to-do. All right. Take care. Thank you, and see you in the next video.